I want to try to do something a little bit different with this episode. There are a lot of stories that lend themselves to the narrative style that I like to use. And with those, it kind of makes sense to write it all out so that I have an idea of where I'm going and I can see where all the pieces fit in and so on and so forth. But then there are stories, maybe they're not even stories, maybe um, maybe they're topics that I just have a lot of thoughts on where sometimes I just want to connect different dots and see where it leads me. And so I wanted to try to do some podcasts that were a little bit more like that. And I'm going to call them history rambles because I'm going to ramble a little bit. I'm not going off of a set script for this episode. I've got a couple of pages of notes in front of me and I'm going to bounce around from topic to topic. So this is a little bit more like maybe just walking into a conversation between two history geeks, which happened a lot in college. But what I want to do is is really kind of get into a topic and see if I can make some sense out of it, stream of consciousness style. The first thing I wanted to talk about, because I just finished reading a book, it's called Clash. It's about presidents in the time of crisis. I'm going to do an interview with the author later on, but it really got me thinking because if we reflect back on the present day for just a second, and especially if we go back to the presidency of President Donald J. Trump, we see this sort of interaction between the United States president and the press that, to me at least, and I'm about to turn 40, seems totally unique. Because I go back and I start to think through, okay, I grew up for President George H.W. Bush, and then really President Clinton's kind of the first president that I can remember. And then, of course, President George W. Bush, who, you know, had his own cantankerous relationship with the press. I mean, somebody threw a shoe at him at one point in Iraq. But still, what we saw with President Trump and to an extent what we're still seeing with President Biden seemed so different to me. I mean, how do we get to this point during the presidency of President Trump that a U.S. president is yelling at and mocking and belittling reporters? How do we end up there? Because what I really want to know is, and this is where the history background, you know, it always is there in the back of my mind. People, you know, when, when, when you tell them that you're a history teacher, when you tell them that you have a history degree or something, they always kind of want to ask about the present day and they want you to explain things. But, um, you know, as a history major, I, I'm not very good at that because I'm good with things that happened hundreds and, for me, thousands of years ago because that's where my interest lies primarily. I'm not so good at explaining what's going on right now, but still, the questions are there and I have the questions. And so I kind of wanted to know, look, as a nation, how do we let this happen? How do we get to this point where we have presidents and presidential press secretaries who are this combative with the press? And I mean combative on a level in which People in the room feel uncomfortable. I feel uncomfortable watching videos of it. And is it new? Or is this just another historical cycle and we're just rinsing and repeating? You know, I, I have to think to an extent part of this is as a result of a crisis of journalism. You know, where we find ourselves right now is we sort of have the decline 
of old school journalism. You know, when I was a kid, you'd get the weekly newspaper and then you'd have the nightly news. And in the newspaper, at least, you know, the, you just trusted that what the people were saying were accurate. And there were a few notable exceptions to that. But normally, you expect that people who are writing the stories, you know, they went to school for journalism, they practice their trade, they have a code of ethics, they have sources. But now we don't have as much journalism. Now we have social media. Most people, still blows my mind, but most people in the United States get their news from social media. I wouldn't trust a recipe that I got off Facebook, let alone a news article. But apparently the vast majority of Americans do trust Facebook at all. And that's where they get their, their news from. But then you kind of have to think about, okay, well, what does journalism reward compared to social media? Because in the old school way, the way that I grew up with, you had to pay a subscription to get that newspaper. Like my father paid for a subscription to get the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Like he put down money for that. And as a result, you know, the interest of the newspaper becomes, well, how do we keep and expand our subscription base? And to do that, I think you've got to tell the truth and you've got to be a good writer and you've got to be good at your trade. Now we have social media and the reward system just changes completely. And I can tell you this as someone who's been dragged kicking and screaming into the social media world to promote the podcast, et cetera, et cetera. Social media does not always reward quality. And it certainly does not reward the truth you get rewarded for in social media are clicks and watches and so on and so forth. So what you want is the banner, the title, the whatever that's going to get the person to click on it. What they do from there, it doesn't really matter. Now, podcasting is a little bit different. You have to subscribe. A lot of people do, not everybody. And so it's a little bit more of an intimate relationship, but if you think about anything from Instagram to Facebook, honestly, even to a lot of news organizations that post exclusively online, the goal is to get the person to click the link because that's how you sell the advertising. And I don't have a subscription to CNN.com or the BBC or any of those sorts of things, but I get news from there. Why? It's because they're, um, they're selling my clicks. They're selling the advertising dollars that come from the time that I spend doing that. Can you imagine if uh, during the election of 1800, you know, we're talking John Adams, Thomas Jefferson here, everything was clickbait. I'd have some stories then. I guess to an extent, I'm a little bit happy about that. And then there's the further problem that comes from this, the social media journalism. And a lot of people have talked about it, and I'm not an expert in it, but it's been mentioned in so many different places that I, I think it's fair to bring it up. Just the question of now, how isolated have we become in what I call your belief bubbles? That is, you only listen to news that is in accord with things that you already think are correct. A lot of people do that. I try not to do it. I try to force myself, actually, to go to the other side. I tend to vote independent, but still, you know, I try to listen to as many sides as possible. It's not always easy. From a personality standpoint, I don't always like the approach of certain news organizations because I don't like yelling, but um, I still try to listen. Question is, though, is that new? And I, the, the answer there is, just so you know, absolutely no. You know, historically, newspapers have been affiliated 
with one or the other political parties. So the fact that you can immerse yourself in only news that you're interested in, that's not new at all. That's been the case for a long time. You can just do it so much more easily. That's the difference. You don't have to subscribe to the Baltimore Democrat or the Baltimore Republican. You just got to click on the right thing. And then the computer feeds you the stuff that you already want. I don't know how much of us realize every day how much of our lives is driven by an algorithm that we didn't write and maybe didn't even know about. I want to quote directly here from a second by Clash, which is by John Marshall. It comes out in May. Quoting now, What caused this tumultuous and perilous relationship between the president and the press? Trump was a uniquely toxic leader. Blaming it all on him would be easy enough. His lack of respect for democratic norms, his fondness for disinformation, his constant need for attention, his obsession with grievances, and his instinct to go for the jugular all contributed to disinformation and dysfunction. But much deeper forces lead us to this point. Trump's unhealthy relationship with the press didn't happen by chance, and it wasn't completely unprecedented. In fact, there were plenty of precedents. They stretch back to the days of George Washington and John Adams, when the United States was first deciding what role the press should play in its democratic experiment. What made Trump's presidency unusual was that all these historic forces came into play all at once with a president who was determined to sabotage the fact-based process embodied by the press for determining the vital information needed for democracy to function, end quote. So Marshall argues throughout the book that there's both nothing new and something new in what we're seeing. And I, I think to a large extent, he's right. Although I do think he downplays the role of social media in this. But let's go all the way back. I want to talk about three presidents today. Because there were three early presidents who set a lot of precedents for the way that the office of the president interacts with the press. And I think to understand where we are as a nation today, you have to go back and look at the way that things develop. Really, between the founding of this nation and maybe, let's say, the Roaring Twenties up to the Second World War. Because a lot of the foundational blocks are in place by then. So I want to go back to America's first president, and I'm not counting George Washington. You know, here's the thing about George Washington. I love George Washington. Everybody loves George Washington. George Washington won unanimously. No one was going to stand up to George Washington. I don't know if you can really even count the first two presidential elections, because who is going to run against the father of his country? So the real first president who, who didn't get, you know, guardrails, because Washington was hardly ever criticized in his first term, criticized a little bit in his second term, but still the jabs were mostly at his ministers and not at him. So the real first president who has to deal with the press and, spoiler alert, doesn't do a good job of it, is the man who's technically the second president of the United States, John Adams. John Adams, I feel bad for the guy at times. Was he literally the worst person to be the second president? Maybe. But he's stuck under Washington's shadow, which would have outstretched him by a lot because Washington was very tall and John Adams was extremely short. The two just didn't cut the same figure. And a big problem for Adams is that he and Thomas Jefferson, 
have sort of created two political parties at this point. You've got the Federalists on one side, and then you've got the Democratic Republicans is what they're called. I'm going to call them Republicans for sake of use here under Jefferson, although we won't talk about them very much. Kind of looking back on it, uh, historian Ron Chernow called it, quote, a time of political savagery with few parallels in American history, a season of paranoia in which the two parties surrendered all trust in each other, end quote. Does that sound familiar? Sounds a little bit familiar to me. And some people will argue that we've had some bad presidents in recent history. But again, I could... John Adams was a, was a nice guy. I mean, his heart was in the right place a lot of the times, but God, was he an awful president in a lot of ways. Even Benjamin Franklin wrote about the guy, quote, He means well for his country, is always an honest man, often a wise one. But sometimes, and in some things, absolutely out of his senses, end quote. Now, don't get me wrong, and I think that sometimes in history, a lot of people that I talk to about American history, and they make some bad assumptions. They, they assume the United States defeated Great Britain in the Revolutionary War. It became immediately the world's greatest superpower with the strongest military, and it has been so ever since. That is not accurate. The reality is, is President John Adams faced a ton of challenges domestically. Just think about this. There's no national currency. There's no dollars to be traded. States are all printing their own currencies. Not that it matters for interstate trade because the roads are terrible. Just getting from Pennsylvania to New York could take days. Slavery persisted even in a country that wrote... All men are created equal. And in the foreign sphere, did I mention? That's right. The French Revolution is burning. And at this point in history, basically every country in Europe is at war with France. And America might become one of them. And to face all these myriad problems, John Adams had zero executive experience. Obviously, George Washington was the first president, so you can't say that he had presidential experience or even gubernatorial experience, but as a military man, he at least was used to a command structure. Adams had none of that. As I mentioned a second ago, Washington's second term sort of saw the cracks creaking in, sort of saw the sunlight, the press for the first time creeping in, trying to influence and or maybe constrain a president? Adding fuel to the fire, while all this was going on, Adams and Jefferson were forming political parties. So Adams is going to come in to the presidency with a group of people who already hate him. And there's very little he can do about it. Now I want to quote again here from Marshall, Quoting, in the minds of Adams and other Federalists, challenge to government policies by Republicans and their newspaper allies weren't the tactics of a loyal opposition in a healthy democracy. Instead, the Federalists believed the challenges were potentially treasonous and threatened the nation. Adams told his most trusted advisor, his wife, Abigail, that the press should carry more content, quoting her now, in favor of the government than there has been, or the sour, angry, peevish, fretful, lying paragraphs which assail it on every side, and will make an impression on many weak and ignorant people. End quote. Now, what she's getting at here is, is important to consider, and that is that newspapers in this age were rough, to say the least. These were not gentlemanly publications. Writers threw insults back and forth, thinking that that somehow, I guess, scored points with their readership, which, as I mentioned, 
was already heavily partisan, there are not a lot of neutral publications at this point. There are Federalist papers and there are Republican papers. In fact, all of this partisanship in the press, you should know, is a big reason why George Washington did not seek a third term. Sure, he wanted to retire, get back to Mount Vernon, but he also didn't want to get kicked around in the press. Adam seethed privately about the insults directed his way in the press. While he publicly did try to be a gentleman and, and not comment. I got to give the guy credit. He even once joined a bucket line to help put out a fire raging through the Philadelphia home of a printer who had just criticized him. So he's got at least some moral compass, right? And he has advantages. Big advantages. The Federalists controlled all three branches of government at this point, though the Supreme Court wasn't much to brag about yet. And so they could control the release of information. They could decide what got put to the press because the ultimate press are going to be the bills and laws that come out of Congress and the statements from the White House. And Adams has total control over all of that. And then in 1789, something else happens. In 1789, Congress passes would have been known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. Now, I want to be clear here. John Adams did not ask for these. But he signed them. The Alien Act, which was about as xenophobic as it gets, allowed President Adams and his administration to detain and deport any immigrants that they wanted to without a hearing. So I guess when it came to all men are created equal, we meant all men are created equal except for foreigners, especially the Irish. Well, I'm Irish, so I can make that joke. But to the press, the Sedition Act was way worse. It allowed the government to just go ahead and prosecute anybody who wrote, printed, or uttered, yeah, uttered, quote, any false, scandalous, and malicious writing or writings against the government of the United States with the intent to defame the said government or the said president or bring them into contempt or disrepute or to excite them, the hatred of the good people of the United States, end quote. If you were convicted of the Sedition Act, you could get up to two years in prison. Now, it's such a broad blanket here, so it all, it all depends on how you're choosing to enforce it, and I'm guessing you knew that. Because if you wanted to enforce this on everybody, well, I mean, you could just go ahead and you could shut down every newspaper in the United States that wrote anything against you. The Adams administration didn't take it that far, but there's a couple of crazy stories out there. There's one story from New York about a guy named Luther Baldwin. He was not a newspaper writer. There was a salute being fired off to support President Adams. Apparently this Baldwin fellow just turned to somebody to his side and said, I don't care if they fire their can- those cannons, quote unquote, up his arse. You know, a little blue humor there. Somebody heard it, though. And it's not going to shock you to know, Mr. Baldwin wound up in jail. He sat there for a couple of months trying to raise the money to pay the $150 fine that that offhanded remark cost him. Stories like that probably give you an indication why the Sedition Act backfired horribly. Instead of cowing all the Republican newspapers like it was supposed to, it strengthened them and strengthened the growing opposition to the Adams administration. 
under Thomas Jefferson. Adams' relationship with the press ultimately proved a major factor in his defeat in the election of 1800. With so few people legally allowed to vote, remember, no women, no African Americans, no men who don't own property. With that few people able to vote, you know that the, the election is going to come down to a few hundred. You need the support in the press. And Adams he managed to alienate just about everyone, pun intended there, with the Alien and Sedition Act. The election of 1800 was unbelievably close. Those of us nowadays who bemoan a president who wins by a few thousand votes in Ohio or Florida or Pennsylvania or wherever may be surprised to know that Adams actually won 65 electoral votes, Jefferson uh, and Aaron Burr, because this is that weird election where Jefferson and Burr didn't indicate on the ballot who was vice president and who was president. And so what ends up happening is they both get 73. The outcome gets decided in the House of Representatives. This is that whole thing. If you've watched the musical Hamilton, this is where Hamilton intervenes and, and goes with Jefferson. Burr shoots him and the rest is history. But if Adams had won just 250 more votes, 250, you can think of a small section. There's, there's apartment buildings that have more than 250 people in them. If he had won just by 250 more votes in New York City, he would have earned a second term. And by the way, and I don't want to ignore this, Adams also would have won had the southern states not had their electoral count inflated by the fact that enslaved persons who absolutely couldn't vote and were absolutely treated as chattel property counted as three-fifths of a person for the purposes of population. You take that away, Adams wins. You give him 251 more votes in New York City, he wins. What cost him was his decision to alienate the press. Abraham Lincoln is kind of a, a different story. I mean, it's the same and different. I mean, obviously, you know, Lincoln is going to try to curtail some elements of free speech during the Civil War itself. But what's interesting about Abraham Lincoln is how we really see, for the very first time, a president whose domestic, and I, I guess you'd say foreign policy because it's a Civil War, would be shaped by the press. And we, we talk about that a lot in the modern days where, you know, are the presidents too responsive to the press? And it, it turns out if that's your complaint, then you definitely would have had that complaint about Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to quote again here from John Marshall, quote, the abolitionists believed in the power of the press to generate change. And they were right. They played a pivotal role in persuading Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Unlike most newspapers of its era, the abolitionist press was part of an advocacy tradition in journalism that unabashedly champions social movements and marginalized groups and has the ability to influence presidential politics, end quote. The abolitionist that is anti-slavery press in this period also had the advantage of boasting some of the nation's best thinkers and certainly its best writers. William Lloyd Garrison uh, was among them. He founded The Liberator, which became almost feared, I want to say, as a existential threat by the pro-slavery South. I mean, every Southern state, everything that's going to be a part of the Confederacy and Kentucky passed laws prohibiting the distribution of abolitionist newspapers as Garrison famously wrote, quote, I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch. And I will be heard, end quote. One of Garrison's 
biggest fans and one of his most avid readers was none other than Frederick Douglass, the man who only escaped slavery in 1838. It's almost impossible for me to overstate Douglass's role in the eventual abolition of slavery. Lincoln, and I'm going to come back to this time and time again here, is, is often referred to as the great emancipator. I'm going to challenge you in this to question how much of that is true. Should Frederick Douglass be considered the great emancipator? It was Douglass who wrote and spoke passionately about the issue and from a perspective that most Americans otherwise could not get. And Douglass was accepted into different circles in American society that other former slaves would only dream of. So he had this huge platform you know, and, and in an era where people get big platforms and they waste it, Douglas is the opposite. He gets a platform and he uses it. He uses it to change the course of American history. He uses it to change the course of Western history. And then, of course, there is... Abraham Lincoln, the man who gets referred to as the great emancipator, the man who freed the slaves as though he single-handedly rode into the American South, border states too, atop a white horse, waving Excalibur recently pulled from the stone, smote all his enemies, and then individually struck the chain off every enslaved person. Obviously, that's not true. And America needs to understand that Abraham Lincoln had a real complicated history when it came to slavery. Quoting Marshall here, quote, Lincoln often contradicted himself when it came to slavery. He despised it as a moral abomination supported emancipation sometime in the distant future, and donated money for people escaping the South on the Underground Railroad. He was one of only six Illinois legislators to vote against a resolution claiming that, quote, the property and the right of slaves is sacred in the slaveholding states by the federal constitution, end quote. Yet, he carried many of the racist ideas held by nearly every white person in his era. He told, quote, darky jokes, doubted the intellectual ability of black people, and opposed allowing them to serve or vote on juries. He thought abolitionists were self-righteous radicals who would, quote, shiver into fragments the union of these states, tear to tatters, its now venerated constitution, and burn the last copy of the Bible rather than slavery should continue one single hour, end quote. Now, I'm going to say this at the outset. Unlike Adams, Lincoln knew he needed the press. The power of journalism had grown exponentially since the turn of the century. Cheaper paper and the invention of the steam press allowed printers to pump out content like never before. Lincoln's own law partner once said of him, quote, He never overlooked a newspaper man who had it in his power to say a good or a bad thing about him. Once he got the nomination... Abolitionist newspapers did quickly warm to Lincoln. Their support proved crucial in the election of 1860, which Lincoln won with only 40% of the popular vote. Douglas rejoiced at Lincoln's election. Quote, 
the masters of slaves have been the masters of the Republic. Lincoln's selection has vitiated their authority and broken their power. It has taught the North its strength and shown the South its weakness, end quote. Still, Lincoln was not interested, and I can't stress this enough, in 1861 in starting a war which purpose was to end slavery. At his first inauguration, he stressed the need to compromise with the South, promising to enforce the Fugitive Slave Act and not to interfere in any way with the institution of slavery where it currently existed. Lincoln didn't want the Civil War. He was willing to do just about anything he could to avoid it. The abolitionists and the abolitionist press, on the other hand, they were overjoyed with the Civil War. They believed that this was the only way that the nation could finally shake itself clean of the scourge of slavery. Throughout the war, abolitionist newspapers would consistently pressure Lincoln to make the war about emancipation, enlist black soldiers into the Union Army, pay them the same, make this a war about morality. But by and large, he wouldn't, at least... Not at first. Abolitionist newspapers kept their complaints muted as the first few months and the first year of the war dragged on. But as Lincoln continued to make it clear that the war was not about emancipation, then they soured on him. But still, they were writing, and Lincoln was paying attention By 1862, Lincoln invited a group of abolitionists to the White House for a conference. It was the first time in United States history that a president had spoken openly with abolitionist leaders. But still, one step forward, one step back. That's kind of how it was with Lincoln between 1861 and maybe 1862, the end of 1862 at least. In spring of 1862, abolitionists pressed Lincoln to issue an emancipation proclamation. He equivocated, saying that was unrealistic at this time. Even Douglas grew frustrated as Lincoln insisted that, you know, even if we get rid of the slavery thing, black and white races need to remain separated. And believe it or not, Lincoln was one of the people who was sponsoring one of those ludicrous colonization plans. It wasn't the Marcus Garvey back to Africa, but it was to Central America, if you can believe it. Lincoln actually theorized in 1862 that the solution to this problem would be to gather up everyone of color, put them on a boat or march them through Mexico, and send them all the way down to Central America. It's insane. And absolutely, Frederick Douglass complained, as he should. He wrote in his monthly, quote, The president is a genuine representative of the American prejudice and Negro hatred, and far more concerned with the preservation of slavery and the favor of the border states than for any sentiment of magnanimity or principle of justice or humanity. End quote. Lincoln responded, quote, My paramount objective in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or destroy slavery. End quote. What these abolitionists did not know is that Lincoln had already secretly 
decided to issue the Emancipation Proclamation and enlist black soldiers in the Union Army by the early summer of 1862. He's already made the decision. But there's a big, big problem. Timing. It's all about the timing. You see, summer of 1862 is still not a good time for Union armies. They're doing fine in the West, Ulysses, as Grant is starting to take control. And things are going to turn around soon. But in the East, boy, it has just been one incompetent Union commander after another incompetent Union commander. You can start to rattle them off. Manassas. Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Second Manassas. The Union Army just bungles into defeat after defeat after defeat. Even though they have overwhelming resources, they just don't have anybody to lead them yet. But then finally, on September 17th, 1862, the Union Army quote-unquote wins and I did put wins in air quotes there because Antietam is really a tie if you're looking at it from a tactical perspective. I mean, sure, the Union Army pushed the Confederates back and stopped them, but the Confederate Army wasn't supposed to be in Union territory in the first place. So we're going to have to call it a push. But either way, this is the best the Union Army has performed to date. No criticism of the soldiers, by the way, or the lower-ranking officers. They just, they just have had terrible luck with the leadership, something that Lincoln himself has been very frustrated with throughout this whole process. But it allows him to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. In only two years, Abraham Lincoln has gone from insisting that the war was not about ending slavery to making that the express goal of the Union war effort from this point forward. Why? Why, it's really hard to escape the conclusion that the abolitionist press just finally goaded him into it. Enough public opinion turned... And yeah, there's a lot of military historians, and I don't mean to discount them because the points that they make are accurate. Though They suggest that this was a military means, right? The hope was, the grand hope was, if we announce this, maybe there'll be a massive slave insurrection in the South. And if that happens, then it will cripple the Confederacy's ability to continue the war, bringing the war to an abrupt end. That does not happen. In fact, it doesn't happen at all. It's not to say that those enslaved people in the Confederacy are just continuing hunky-dory. You know, they're resisting in a lot of different ways. That goes beyond the purview of this ramble, at least. But what I find fascinating is how William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass push Lincoln to this position in only two years. That at the beginning of the war, he considered to be absolutely absurd. And so on January the 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation becomes final. There's also an announcement at the same time that the authorities are going to work with the border states about slowly emancipating. So on January the 1st, 1863, there is a real chance... That's a good one. For the first time in American history that we might not have anyone in bondage. And we have to thank the press for it. I mean, Frederick Douglass himself declares it, quote, the greatest event in our nation's history. And it's right to put his quotation on it, by the way, because I think it's a lot to do with him. If it wasn't for Frederick Douglass, I'm not sure that Lincoln does this in 1862. 
I don't know why he doesn't get a statue in Washington, by the way. I used to live there, and um, seems like we're giving out statues nowadays, like they're running out of style. Or maybe we're, we're also replacing old ones that we don't like anymore, you know, folks who have run afoul and so on and so forth. And some of them I, I certainly do agree with. I don't understand why you would have a statue of someone who fought against you in your country. I mean, you don't, you don't go to Russia nowadays and find a lot of statues of Napoleon. But how about a statue for Frederick Douglass? I think it's time. There's room on the mall. I've been there. Let's fit him in. In the summer of 1863, Frederick Douglass visited Lincoln in the White House. As he walked in, lawmakers and people waiting to see the president sneered at him, shouting all kinds of derogatory insults. But while they waited... Lincoln ushered him in immediately. Lincoln would even brag that he had read all of Douglas' work and was a big fan. If this wasn't the world upside down, I don't know what was. The President of the United States bragging to know an African American showed just how far Lincoln had gone and just how far Douglas' work and work in the press had pushed him. And Douglas kept pushing for social change, voting rights, all kinds of other things. And Lincoln kept moving as well, dropping the bizarre idea of colonizing Central America with emancipated slaves, etc., etc. Douglas knew that there was a lot of work to do. He would argue, quote, The work of the American Anti-Slavery Society will not have been completed until the black men of the South and the black men of the North shall have been admitted fully and completely into the body politic of America, end quote. It really is amazing during this period over how influential Douglas becomes when we think about Abraham Lincoln During a later conversation that Lincoln and Douglas had, Lincoln shared with him a letter that he proposed to make public, a letter that would have informed the readers that the goal of the Civil War continues to be reuniting the country and not emancipation. Douglas replied simply, quote, It would be taken as a complete surrender of your anti-slavery policy. And do you serious damage, end quote. No, you shouldn't publish the letter, Douglas told him. Be a complete mistake, and Lincoln listened. He did not publish the letter, illustrating Douglas's influence one more time. Later on, during the ad election campaign of 1864, Douglas would write glowingly of Lincoln, He treated me as a man. He did not let me feel for a moment that there was any difference in the color of our skins. And Douglas further went on to recommend to all his readers, vote for Lincoln, support Lincoln. Quote, every man who wishes well to the slave and to the country should at once rally with all the warmth and earnestness of his nature to the support of Abraham Lincoln. End quote. Thanks in a large part to Lincoln's support by the abolitionist press in the North, he won the election of 1864 easily. He carried all but three states of the Union and won 55% of the popular vote. The election of 1864 then paved the way for the passage of the 13th Amendment, which would forever outlaw slavery in the United States of America. On January the 31st, 1865, it passed by two votes. Abolitionists, including Frederick Douglass, packed the gallery to watch the momentous moment when the United States declared once and for all 
that slavery was dead as an institution. And when I say that, I know that some people are going to say, well, there's still wage slavery and there's still penal slavery and so on and so forth. But those are slavery by another name. What I'm talking about here is American chattel slavery, whereby one person can literally be sold to another. And it ended, thanks in large part to Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, and the rest of the abolitionist press. Douglass would attend Lincoln's second inaugural. And here I want to quote again from historian John Marshall. The two men, Lincoln and Douglass, chatted. One, enslaved at birth, had risked his life for nearly a quarter of a century to advocate for emancipation. The other, who once believed the government shouldn't end slavery, had used his power to do more to free black Americans than any white person in this country's history, end quote. But I think it's almost wrong to see them as separate organisms. What we're really talking about here are two sides of the same coin. Lincoln had the power, yes, but the abolitionist press, and especially Frederick Douglass, influenced Lincoln to change his position on key issues and made the Civil War about emancipation, even though it definitely didn't start that way. There was a long way to go, though. Lincoln still balked at giving all black Americans the vote and went on record to say so. He wanted to grant suffrage only to former black soldiers. Abolitionists would bring their hands, but recognized it was a step. By 1865, many abolitionists believed that the work was done. William Lloyd Garrison would close up shop that year, finishing production of The Liberator. Struggling with debt, Frederick Douglass ended his own newspaper. It was the end of an era, though there still remained a lot to do. It's really fascinating to think about how much President Lincoln changed. And of course, he'd be assassinated a short time after William Lloyd Garrison closed up his shop. Lincoln came into the White House absolutely unwilling to consider emancipation as the goal for the Civil War. He was totally willing to compromise with the South, but throughout the process of two to three years, he went from that position to the complete opposite, making it a war to end the institution of slavery. And if it wasn't for Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, and the rest of the abolitionist press, I don't think he would have been able to do it. Now, of course, there's one part of Lincoln here that we haven't really talked about, and it's a good segue as we move forward, because Lincoln would suspend civil rights in a way that no other president had. Now, I, I go back and forth on this. Did he have to do it because of the war? To an extent, yes, I mean, you can't have full-scale insurrections destroying the capacity of the Union to fight the war, especially when you think about those border states. I'm talking about Maryland, especially, Kentucky, so on and so forth. And unlike John Adams, by the way, Lincoln had a very unfriendly Supreme Court led by the infamous Chief Justice Taney, who would attempt to strike down all of Lincoln's decisions. Then again, Taney and the Dred Scott case had declared not only that slavery was legal, but it was a good thing and that it would be perpetuated forever and ever and ever. So you have to take any Taney decision with a grain of salt. But Lincoln did suspend habeas corpus. He suspended a lot of the ability of newspapers to publish in those border states if what they were writing was in support of slavery and or in support of the South. So he wasn't a man at that point that was willing to hear from all sides. But I think the moment that the Civil War 
1863 turns into a moral crusade. You can kind of see how, well, we don't want those different ideas percolating when it becomes a war to end the institution of slavery. But Lincoln wouldn't do nearly as much as the last president that I want to talk about when it comes to the suspension of civil liberties. And that is Woodrow Wilson. Of all the presidents that we've talked about so far, even compared to John Adams, who signed into law the Alien and Sedition Acts, Wilson would be by far and away the most dangerous president for any dissidents in the press. Just hear what historian John Marshall has to say. Quote, By the end of the war in 1918, the Justice Department had prosecuted nearly 2,200 people under the Espionage and Sedition Acts, convicting more than 1,050. The defendants included journalists, as well as labor leaders, pacifists, socialists, anarchists, German Americans, and Irish Americans. These prosecutions were part of a sweeping expansion of presidential power during Wilson's administration that included censoring the press intimidating dissidents, and surveilling citizens. As Wilson rallied America to the cause of making the world safe for democracy, he significantly limited freedom at home. End quote. A Wilson biographer, A. Scott Berg, would write similarly. No previous president, he said, had, quote, ever suppressed free speech to so great an extent in order to realize his principles, unquote. And principles are important to Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson has one of the more unique and rapid rises to the presidency of anyone in presidential history. He was an academic a Ph.D. from Princeton University in New Jersey. His one true gift, his fastball that he would go to over and over again, were his public speaking skills. The man, according to all sources, was a brilliant orator. He used those skills to great effect. The New Jersey bosses thought he'd be a perfect fit for governor, and he won in 1910. And then he becomes president as part of the Democratic Party, and this is that weird election. If you know your U.S. history in 1914, he's only going to win with 42% of the popular vote, one of the lowest ones we've seen so far. But that's because it was a three-way race. In 1914, that's the election that pits Taft, the Republican, against Taft's former mentor, Teddy Roosevelt, who forms his own third party, the Bull Moose Party. They split the vote, and Wilson coasts to a comparatively easy victory. Now, I want to start out by saying that Woodrow Wilson didn't like the press. He didn't do well with the press. His initial relationship with the press suffered because he was constantly being compared unfavorably to Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt loved talking to the press. He was warm, open, did a great job of courting those relationships. Woodrow Wilson was the exact opposite. He was a PhD, an academic. He was, especially in his opinion, smarter than all the reporters in the room. He didn't need to explain any of his policies or justify them. These policies were obviously better. He came up with them. He was the smart guy. He was from Princeton. These were just some lowly muckrakers. To say that he was haughty in his relationship with the press would be the understatement of the very new century that is the 20th one. 
historian George Jurgens observed of Wilson. He had never met their kind, that is, the reporters, at Princeton, and didn't quite know what to make of them. Part of the reason he and the press clashed is that they were strangers to one another, end quote. Actually, during the 1912 campaign, Wilson was advised by some reporters to open up a little bit more. He responded, quote, I'd do what you advise if I could, but it's not my nature, end quote. And I, I do think that kind of gets to the heart of it. Dealing with the press, it wasn't something that was ever in Wilson's character to do. And remember, when he comes into the office of the presidency in 1914, he's only been in politics for four years. He didn't have the experience that some other American politicians had. He was used to lecturing to students. And oftentimes, he would lecture to the press as though they were his undergrads. By the time Wilson took office in 1913, Jurgens, that same historian, noted that he was, quote, thoroughly disillusioned with the press and the press thoroughly disillusioned with Woodrow Wilson. And I should say, as an aside, Wilson also did not appreciate, that's underlined, how the press would talk about his family. <laughs> he took a very gentlemanly view of all of this politics. He thought that family was off limits, and he absolutely went insane when people talked about his first wife after she died in 1914. But you know what? Unfortunately for Wilson, this was a really bad time to hate the press and to have the, the press hate you. Radio is still in its infancy, and there's a really interesting what if that I want to talk about a little bit more at the end here about what might have happened if radio would have been a more powerful force because... Wilson was such a good public speaker, but it doesn't matter. He didn't really have that medium yet. FDR is going to get it, but Wilson didn't have it. He was stuck with the newspapers. And at this point in American history, there's over 2,200 daily papers being printed and 14,000 weeklies. So the market is just saturated with print. But... Even though the press didn't like him, and Wilson didn't like the press, his speaking skills and eloquence still led him to success in his first term. Even though that relationship was poor, the seeds that are going to bear the ill fruit, those are going to come later. I will give Wilson credit for this. He recognized that he didn't do well with the press. And so he appointed two key advisors, Colonel Edward M. House and Joseph Tumulty, who were going to help him out with it. Tumulty is the one that I want to focus on, though, because Tumulty is the one who started the White House press conference as an idea. So up until 1913, you know, there really isn't a White House press conference. He's the first person that gets it going. The first one, which was held on March 15th, 1913, was a disaster. An absolute disaster. Uh, it, again, he thought he was going to go out there, this is tumulty, and lecture. The press thought they were going to get to ask questions. They weren't on the same page. It didn't work out. But really from 1913, March of 1913, through 1916, they went well. And it was a way for Wilson to sort of assuage the concerns of the press and to let people like Tumulty, who could do a much, much better job. House was great, by the way, also. Colonel House from Texas, he was fantastic about smoothing issues over with the press. Very personable. The exact opposite of Woodrow Wilson. So these two guys together were able to kind of give Wilson that landing pad that he needed. But Wilson was never interested in continuing these press conferences. Once Woodrow Wilson wins re-election in 1916, 
from 1916 to the time he departs office, he holds only four press conferences. That's one per year. You know, but what's interesting is that Wilson still got good press throughout all of it, largely up until the very end. And it's easy to see why. His domestic achievements were really impressive. Woodrow Wilson, you know, he's the World War I president. So we tend to only focus on him through the lens of World War I. But he was president for five, five and a half years almost before the United States entered World War I. So a lot of his achievements are domestic in nature and they predate the involvement in what was then called the Great War. He's the president who got us the progressive income tax system that we have today. Child labor protections. An eight-hour workday for railroad workers. He reduced tariffs and put in stronger antitrust laws. All things that were going to benefit the common American. All things that were going to benefit the consumer. Working class people. So he was praised in a lot of newspapers. Of course, if you notice, I just said a lot. I didn't say all. But this time, I'm not going to say Republican newspapers because mostly he was blasted by people who were in the minority. Suffragettes who wanted the right for women to vote. Didn't appreciate Wilson's attitude towards the subject, but especially Wilson found himself constantly criticized in the black press and for very good reasons. Woodrow Wilson is going to do almost nothing to curtail the number of lynchings that are going on in the United States, to do anything to deal with the Jim Crow laws permeating the South. And don't forget, Woodrow Wilson is also the president who praised the birth of a nation, the extremely racist film, called it the best film he'd ever seen. But... Wilson is known for World War I, and that's where most of the story comes in. World War I, of course, raging since the autumn of 1914, late summer. Now, Wilson really wanted to stay out of it, and I do mean really. Even after the Lusitania was sank, it's a British vessel carrying some American passengers, torpedoed by a German U-boat, sinks in 1915. There's an enormous amount of outrage. But Wilson actually does his best to sidestep the issue. Even after a few more torpedoes took out a few more ships with American passengers, Wilson still preached the need for neutrality. I wonder what a president would do today. I mean, President Biden's in the White House right now. The conflict with Russia and the Ukraine is ongoing. I wonder how President Biden would react if, say... A British Airways plane was shot down by the Russians carrying American passengers. This is really simple. It's almost exactly what we've got going on here in 1915, 1916, and early 1917. Through it all, even though American lives are being lost, Wilson preaches the need for neutrality. And that neutrality was one of the keys to his re-election in 1916. He was barely reelected, but thanks to newspaper support in the key states of Ohio and California, he carried the day, albeit by literally, and this is an exact number, 3,306 votes in California. He kept us out of the war, that was the slogan. But by 1917, the writing's on the wall. Too many U boats. Too much unrestricted submarine warfare. And then the Zimmerman telegram is the thing that breaks the dam. The Zimmerman telegram is actually a message that gets intercepted and then given to the White House. It's a sort of damning telegram in which the Germans are trying to strike an alliance with Mexico. They they figure that the United States is going to get into the war, but maybe if we can get Mexico engaging the United States on the southern border, then... They won't be able to send troops over to Europe. 
if that was what they believed. And there's a lot of debate about the Zimmerman telegram. Maybe I'll do another one of these all about that. I don't want to get into it too much, but let's just say it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And on April 2nd, 1917, Wilson reluctantly appeared before Congress and requested a declaration of war. He got it. Now, Wilson had been very critical of Lincoln's suspicion of civil rights and liberties during the U.S. Civil War. Now, he would do 200 times more what Lincoln had ever done. The United States Navy took control of all commercial wireless stations, etc., etc. The government seized cable lines, telegraphs. Because Wilson believed in, quote-unquote, total war. Which, to him, meant using everything. Means using mass advertising and marketing to rouse public opinion. And he needed to do it, by the way, because before the war, the entire United States Army, and it's hard for us to think about this today, but before 1917... The entire United States Army, I'm talking soldiers, I'm talking officers, so on and so forth, probably would have fit into a football stadium. Now it needed to become an immense and effective fighting force. But what Wilson can really be criticized for is he launches this massive propaganda and censorship program. It's called the Committee on Public Information, or CPI for short. And when I say they launched a government propaganda campaign, I mean the United States government went bananas. Everything from sending public school teachers pre-written lessons about the importance of supporting the war and the military and the evil that was the German Hun. They were sending out lessons to teachers, to teach kids this in school. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if we did that today? Can you imagine if the United States government dropped off mandatory lessons? You know, Putin is evil, so on and so forth. Maybe he is. I'm certainly not a Putin fan or apologist sitting here. Can you imagine if, you know, maybe you have kids, if your children were all of a sudden being taught government-sponsored? Lessons? And it was more than that. You know, they had these sort of fair outings where kids and adults and stuff, they could go to look at real weapons from the front. You could see a a Gatling gun, a machine gun for the first time. See somebody fire it. Wow, neato. Look at that. Now let's go get some hot dogs, right? A lot of bunting, a lot of fireworks, a lot of propaganda and lining up behind the flag. Initially, CPI really didn't have to do a whole heck of a lot when it came to censorship. Nearly all newspapers submitted to voluntary censorship. They knew what was right to publish at this time, and right would be in quotation marks. They didn't want to be branded as traitors. No newspaper wanted to do that. This was a war that was extremely popular for the United States to get into, by and large. Nobody wanted to lose subscriptions because they came out against it. And so there wasn't a lot of censorship, at least initially. Only a few newspapers criticized the war effort. Chief among them, the Milwaukee Sentinel, near and dear to my heart, St. Louis Democrat, etc., etc. The same people who criticized Wilson, though, before 1917, criticized him afterwards. I'm talking about marginalized papers, feminist papers, black newspapers, especially black newspapers, because as they're going to continue to point out, Wilson isn't doing anything about the domestic violence at home. This is one of the biggest periods of lynching in the United States history. And he does almost nothing about it. Why are we fighting for democracy abroad if we're not going to fight for democracy at home? And that... It goes along with the fact that black enlisted men were paid less than white enlisted men, a criticism that irked these same individuals. But Wilson believed 
any criticism of the war was akin to being a traitor. And so he pushed for an even stronger espionage act that would give the administration intense censorship powers. Congress went along with it, even though they would ultimately give Wilson what he thought was a watered-down version of the same bill. But this watered-down version was more than enough, believe me. In it, the Postmaster General was now given the right to restrict mail, to read mail, to stop any publications. Just take them right out if they thought that it was against the United States government or against the war effort. An indication of how successful this was? By the end of the decade, by the end of the 1910s, most German language newspapers had stopped publishing. But the war gave Wilson even more power. We look back at World War I today and we just assume that the Allies were going to win against the Central Powers. But they weren't assuming that even in 1918. In 1918, it looked like Germany might still win the war. Russia, dealing with the Bolshevik Revolution now, has pulled out. They've signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Terrible treaty for them. It's not going to matter in the end because the Treaty of Versailles is going to supersede it, but it's there for now. And with its eastern front protected, Germany is now going to hurl all its best troops toward France in one last-ditch effort to knock them out of the war. Sensing this, Congress is going to give Wilson even more power. They're going to give him a new Sedition Act. And this new Sedition Act was sweeping. Wilson signed it with glee. It gave him the power and made it illegal. So it's now illegal in the United States to say, write, or publish anything that contained, now I'm quoting directly from the Sedition Act, disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the form of the government of the United States. That's pretty broad. You could use that Sedition Act today and shut down a lot of news channels, depending upon who's in power. I'm actually kind of surprised. Nobody had attempted to revive something like that in the relative recent history of the United States. I'll tell you right now, Wilson didn't hesitate to use those powers. He shut down production of newspapers, nascent radio stations, even film. Film is a small industry at this point, but when Robert Goldstein produced The Spirit of 76, Wilson shut it down. Why? Well, the British were their allies right now, and they didn't want any films out there that might rouse public opinion against the British, who, of course, we fought in 1776. History was now banned, all in the name of democracy abroad. And if you think that Wilson, by the way, is using this law aggressively, just get a load of Postmaster General Albert Burleson. He used these laws to put his foot on the throat of press freedoms. He interpreted the Sedition Act, the Espionage Act, at all to mean that publications couldn't, quote, say that this government got in the war wrong, that it is in it for the wrong purposes, or anything that will impugn the motives of the government for going into the war. They cannot say that this government is the tool of Wall Street or the munitions maker. That kind of thing makes for insubordination in the Army and Navy and breeds a spirit of disloyalty throughout the country. 
End quote. Even Wilson, while leading the country to new levels of fear and intolerance, sometimes believed that Burleson went too far. And these laws and these attitudes, the attitudes that they covet, because of course you're sending a message as the government, right? You're sending a message. This is how we want our citizens to behave. That's what laws do. Laws are there to provide structure, but they're also a codified way of a society and civilization saying, this is what we are. This is what we are about. And laws and attitudes have real consequences. For example, in Collinsville, Illinois, a mob lynched a man suspected of being sympathetic to the Germans. So now just as much as maybe having a German flag, maybe having some books in German, maybe saying something that isn't just pure and unadulterated hate about the Kaiser and the Germans, maybe that gets you killed. At the very least, it gets your newspaper shut down, gets your mail confiscated. Now, by and large, throughout this period, the federal courts are going to side with Woodrow Wilson. And there's a reason for this. There aren't a lot of precedents about limitations on the First Amendment coming into World War I. World War I is where we see those precedents develop. And so Wilson is just going to be able to successfully sort of push his way through. Even the, the socialist labor leader, Eugene Debs, is going to find himself thrown in prison as a result of this. His conviction will be upheld by the United States Supreme Court. The biggest decision is Abrams versus the United States, a court case that involved Jewish immigrants. They were distributing leaflets. It was actually had nothing to do about fighting the Germans, which is interesting. Their leaflets were all about not sending United States troops to Russia to get involved in their civil war between the Reds and the Whites. They were convicted of violating the Sedition Act and Espionage Act. And the United States Supreme Court upheld those convictions. Two justices, however, dissented. Wendell Holmes and Brandeis. And these dissents actually pave the way for later rulings against United States presidents who tried to restrain the free press. By the time that Germany signs the armistice on November 11th, 1918, Woodrow Wilson is absolutely the most powerful and one of the most respected men in the world. Everybody is waiting to see what is going to happen in Paris and at Versailles. This is supposed to be a different kind of peace talk. A peace talk that's going to result in the end of war forever. People are excited. They want news. But Wilson makes the decision again. Remember, he hates the press. He makes the decision to block journalists from participating in the Paris peace talks. So no news is going to come out of these, even though they are quite literally debating what the new borders of Europe are going to look like. And if you know anything about the Versailles Peace Treaty, you know some special interests are going to do a great job. They're going to do a great job of getting their interests through. Greece is going to get a hold of big chunks of what is today modern-day Turkey until Turkey rises up and pushes them right back out of Constantinople and it's right back into Istanbul. Now, ultimately, Wilson had to back down from this no journalist, no journalist, no way policy. He had to pull back because otherwise they threatened to just pick up their stuff and go home. I mean, what's the point of hanging around Paris? It's lovely, right? But what's the point of hanging around there if you're not going to get the story anyway? So he had to allow journalists access to some information, but they still did it with like a drip, drip, drip sort of a thing. Journalists were only getting a tip of the iceberg, and they were only getting what everybody agreed they should get. And so it's a fraction of the information. And so this here is going to be 
Wilson's big comeuppance with the press. Because I will say this, he's he and John Adams are the two presidents, and Wilson more even than Adams, are, are the two presidents who tangle with the press and they lose. They absolutely lose because here's the issue. Wilson still needs congressional support to pass this treaty when he gets back. And there is no radio. In 20 years, there are, it's going to be radio for FDR. And so Wilson needed the press to get the United States on board with this treaty and crucially to get the United States on board with his big idea, the League of Nations. So the League of Nations was going to be like a modern day United Nations. Countries were going to be bound to each other and defend each other in the event that one was attacked. The idea was essentially very simple. You create so many interlocking alliances that no one can declare war on anyone or anybody else because if you do, you're going to fight every single other major military power in the world at the same time. But this isn't going to be a popular part of the treaty in the United States. Republicans are back in control of Congress and the United States is starting to skew isolationist. So the idea of getting involved in another war in France, just because someone else attacked France, isn't necessarily going to jive with a lot of people back in the United States. And so Wilson desperately has to have the press. He has to have them on his side to sell this treaty, and he absolutely does not. Now, there's an interesting what if here, I think, because... Wilson gets back in the United States. He's exhausted. He doesn't have the support that he thought that he was going to have to pass this treaty. And the treaty isn't even what he wanted. Wilson gets browbeaten, particularly by the French, but also by the British and the Italians, into being much harsher on Germany than he originally wanted to be. And to grant a whole bunch of crazy concessions to states in Europe that he never anticipated. But now he's got to get this sold. And I think if, if he had radio, if Woodrow Wilson had radio, I think he might have done it because that was his advantage. His advantage was able, being able to, through public speaking, to court public opinion. And so if he had that means, that medium, he could have done so much better, but he didn't. And so instead... Wilson decides he's going to go on an 8,000-mile speaking tour by train, and he's going to try to visit every single state west of the Mississippi. And so he's going to try to personally sell this treaty. He was going to try to use his oratory. He was going to give 40 speeches in 21 days. Try to talk to them always about this new idealized version of the world where everyone's going to cooperate, no one's going to fight. He said in one speech, quote, There is one thing that the American people always rise to and extend their hand to, and that is the truth of justice and of liberty and of peace. End quote. So he said that on the night of September 25th, 1919. Just outside Pueblo, Colorado. And then in Wichita, Kansas, remember he's traveling all over the place. Wilson suffers was probably a stroke. In fact, if you go back to his time in Paris, there is significant evidence that he was already suffering from a series of medical setbacks and was weak when he agreed to do this 8,000-mile speaking tour. So then on September 25th, 1919, it all comes crashing down. He suffers a stroke. He gets rushed back to Washington, D.C. immediately. And that's where they find that he's suffered a cerebral thrombosis, which is a blood clot leading in an artery to the brain. 
It almost killed him. In any event, it paralyzed the left side of his body permanently and left him far too weak to lobby for his treaty's passage. In November 1919, almost on the anniversary of the end of the Great War, the United States Senate rejected the treaty with popular support. I want to quote here from historian Marshall one more time. During his presidency, Wilson set a strong precedent for future presidents to deploy the full power of the federal government to hide information, use propaganda, and suppress journalism in times of war and increasingly in times of peace. While he led the United States to victory in the fighting, Wilson made the country less safe for democracy. The Espionage Act he approved remains on the books, and recent presidents, especially Barack Obama and Donald Trump, have used it against the press. End quote. Wilson has a pretty sad end to his presidency. His wife is actually arguably the president for the last couple of months of his term. But the precedents that he left us with echo today, as multiple historians that I've talked about today have recognized. Wilson allowed the United States government to strangle the press and change it in ways that he wanted it to look. It's totally different from Lincoln, right? Lincoln is influenced by the press. Wilson tries to force his influence upon the press. Two different scenarios, and I think we end up with the end result that Lincoln's approach is better. The word better should be underlined there. Certainly it's more moral. Certainly it's in keeping with American ideals, and that's, that's one of the biggest problems, of course, when it comes to the United States presidents dealing with the press, because we have the First Amendment, which expressly says that there should be freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of press. But increasingly, presidents have only liked that when it's things that are nice about them, to quote a recent one. But, as I hope we've talked about today, by no means is this an entirely new phenomenon. Rather, what we're experiencing right now is just the kind of stuff that John Adams, Abraham Lincoln to an extent, Certainly Woodrow Wilson did vis-a-vis the press, but it's just on steroids. Social media has made us more willing to believe things that jive with the ideas that we already have and reinforced our pre-existing conceptions of the world. Presidents are increasingly going to be able to take advantage of that. So until we go back, until we start again to listen to those who are different than us, presidents are going to be able to use their power, powers that come from the past, to manipulate the way we see things. 